everyone, I'm Kat, your host for the sixth episode of I'm Patients Ask a Doctor series. So our topic for this month is Pillow Talk. So this is a very interesting topic since we will be talking about sleep health, common sleep disorders, and misconceptions about sleep. I believe this is a relevant topic for many of us who are feeling anxious and having difficulty sleeping at night, especially during these times of uncertainty. So today, we've invited a very special guest to answer some questions and share his tips on how to improve your sleep. So with us this evening is Dr. Michael Alexius Sarte, a renowned otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, and sleep specialist with over 20 years of experience. In fact, he is the first ENT sleep specialist in the Philippines. Aside from being an international fellow and member of the American Academy of ENT HNS Sleep Disorders Committee and the past president of the Philippine Society of Sleep Medicine, Dr. Sarte is also the consultant director of the Center for Snoring and Sleep Disorders in the Medical City and the unit head of the Department of ENT HNS Sleep Laboratory in Rizal Medical Center DOH. So let's all welcome Dr. Michael Alexius Sarte. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Good evening, Kat. Good evening to your viewers. Thank you so much. I am patient for inviting. So we're happy to have you, Doc. So we have a lot of questions prepared for you tonight, both from our team and our followers. So I'm sure our viewers are very eager to get answers, so let's jump right to it. So we all know that sleep is essential, and it is just as important as eating, drinking, and breathing. It doesn't just affect our physical health, but our mental health as well. So let's start with understanding the sleep cycle. So, Doc, for the first question, what are the different stages of sleep and what is the most important stage? There are generally four, four stages of sleep. Um, the first stage is, uh, as I say, the transitional stage of sleep, stage one. That's actually, we spend when we, um, especially for adult, uh, the adult, of course, there's a difference between adult sleep um, stages uh, and there's a difference between that and with with kids but for adults usually we enter sleep through stage one stage one is probably five to ten minutes so it's very shallow sleep um, after stage one you go to stage two which is what we call our middle sleep middle sleep is about 50 percent of uh, our sleep for adults then uh, stage three is already deep sleep okay deep sleep uh, and uh, the stage four, or actually REM sleep, uh, stage three is deep sleep or slow wave sleep. And then you have REM sleep because the first three stages, although a little bit technical, the first three stages are non-REM, whereas the, the next one or the fourth, if you may call it, is rapid eye movement stage. Um, slow wave sleep stage three and REM sleep, these are known as deep sleep. So this is about 20, 25, 20 to 25% of our sleep. When we talk about the benefits we get from sleep, it's important to get both the deep sleep, slow wave sleep, that's stage three, and REM sleep. That's where we talk about refreshing, uh, uh, getting ourselves refreshed, help with our memory for the next, uh, for our, uh, for the next day, help with our immune system. So, uh, of course, all sleep stages are important. But to answer your question, of course, it's important for us adults to have both slow wave sleep, stage three, and REM sleep. Thank you for that, Doc. So to our viewers, if you don't feel well rested, your sleep cycle must be interrupted. Now, we know that it's important to complete the sleep stages before we wake up. Most of us are familiar with waking up in the middle of the night and feeling like we haven't had any sleep at all. So it's very interesting to learn about the role of each sleep stage, especially when we want to achieve deeper sleep, especially since for a lot of us, we're working from home or we're studying online. So it's really quite hard also to achieve all those stages of sleep when you're anxious, or you're thinking about the homework for the next day and everything. So just a follow up question for that. Since you mentioned that deep sleep is the third and the fourth stages are the most important. So what causes the lack of sleep during these stages? Like what interrupts them and what possibly causes them to be shortened? That's a very good question, Kat. When you talk about um, things that prevent us from getting quality and probably quantity of sleep, you have so many factors. Um, if we're talking about uh, environmental factors, that's not unusual. Of course, uh, when we're talking about our, our work, our, of course, financial situation, 
our social responsibilities, our domestic responsibilities, and our environment in general, these can contribute to a condition where we get stressed. So we're talking about something that can uh, affect our thinking, our, our psyche psychologically. So those, that's, that's, that's one, of course, um, and we talk about uh, one part. The other part is internal or our own health, our own medical uh, concerns. Okay, so probably the first one is with regard to the mind. The second one is with regard to the body. So for individuals who have medical conditions, we talk about um, infections. We talk about um, metabolic conditions like diabetes, heart conditions. Okay, uh, these are uh, medical conditions, if not checked, can of course affect not only those two stages, the sleep, but your overall sleep in general. So those are the things. So it's, it's uh, one is in, uh, based on a mind, uh, concern to the mind, and of course, stress in our environment. And the second one is with regard to our medical health, so mind and body. Those, if they are not checked, if there are concerns with regard to that, they can affect our, our quality and also quantity of sleep. So that's why I feel very bangag pala in the mornings. <laughs> I, I stay up sometimes late at night kasi talaga. If I have a lot of things to do for the next day, ganyan, it stresses me out also. So it's very important nga daw, diba, to like relax na lang talaga muna before you sleep because it really helps the quality of sleep, I think. But since a lot of our viewers also, I'm sure, have stayed up late to binge watch their favorite shows or to finish projects, assignments, since quarantine started last year, you know, it's kind of become a part of the new normal. Narin. But habits like this could definitely take a toll on us, especially when it comes to sleep. And yun nga, it's mind, body, and it affects everything talaga eh. So we all know that sleep deprivation has negative effects, but what really happens in the body when we don't get enough sleep? So maybe you could also share with us like information on what is considered optimal in terms of sleep hours. Because sometimes people say six lang pwede na. Sometimes they say eight talaga, hindi non-negotiable. So ano pa talaga yung optimal in terms of for adults, ganyan, for mga young adults and for adults na rin? Um, Of course, if we talk about uh, adults, um, if you can get seven hours, that's great. But if you're asking yourself and telling yourself you need seven hours, 7.5 hours, or even eight hours, that in itself can, can already be a form of stress. Keep on thinking about that. So in other words, when you talk about the number, there's no, if, if you can get maybe seven and a half hours, then that's great. But if you can get, because um, there are a lot of factors that's going to determine how many hours of sleep you can really need on an individual basis and for all your listeners and viewers if you want to know what you can do you can have a sleep diary um, for two weeks um, jot down the time of night you're sleeping then the, the time of uh, the time in the morning you wake up and count the number of hours for two weeks and, and write down there where you feel the greatest so, which is said more or less that's number of hours is, that's good for you Having said that, based on data, if you can get about uh, five, maybe six to eight hours of sleep, because oversleeping uh, may not be healthy as well. That, no? So, but if you can get five to six up to eight hours of sleep in that range, then that you, you should be okay. You should be okay because um, it, it's very, as I mentioned, there's so many factors. There's also genetic factors. There are some who really are longer sleepers, some, some really shorter sleepers, but of course, in general, if you can have about that number of hours range, you should be okay. Okay, that's only the duration. Let's also talk about the depth, okay? It's not like when you turn off, yeah, it's not our sleep. It's not like when you turn off the engine in the car, that's it. No, when we, when we go to sleep, of course, our mind, okay? And we talked about the stages of sleep. Our mind uh, is, is, of course, working. It is still uh, firing, um, as we as we call it, um, the waves. Remember, our brain waves are still working. And so, when we when I talked about the stages of sleep a while ago, that also pertains to brain wave changes during sleep. And you have to have about four to five cycles of those four stages. You have to have stage one, two, three, which is deep sleep, 
uh, so you sleep. And then the fourth or REM, okay? And then you go back again to stage one. So that's one cycle. So you should have about four to five uh, cycles roughly per night in addition to the number of hours of sleep. You have to have uh, at least probably six to eight or five to eight. You can get seven and that's also good. So in other words, when we talk about getting the full benefits that you can of sleep and not fall into the, the, the effects of sleep deprivation that you mentioned, you have to have not only good quantity or duration, but also good quality or depth. Well, it's actually really informative because I never thought of keeping like a sleep diary because like as you said like um, I used to always think that there's like a specific set of hours especially since as kids like growing up our parents would always tell us to get at least eight hours of sleep but then sometimes I feel better sleeping just for six hours or seven hours so I think yeah it is very important because it differs from um, person to person I think we're just very used to hearing this basic thing that's like, no, you should get at least eight hours of sleep. But yeah, it's really, it's really nice to know also that, you know, it's not weird for you to be okay with just five hours of sleep or six hours of sleep. So thanks for explaining that really well. So to our listeners, especially the night owls and the workaholics, you heard it from Dr. Sarte. It's not just the quantity, it's also the quality. So you have to rest your mind, even if it's you're very busy, you have to rest your mind so you can recharge yourself for the next day. So it's very clear that a solid night's sleep is essential for a long and healthy life as well. And with all the information going around about sleep, it can sometimes be difficult to know what to believe. So for the next part of our session, Doc, we hope you can debunk some common sleep myths. So I think you've already kind of touched on this one. But this one is like an easy one. So more sleep is always better. Myth or fact? Because there are some people when they're very tired, they do feel better sleeping 12 hours a day. But for other people, they just like me, I feel so much more tired when I sleep like 10 hours or 12 hours. So how, how does that whole thing go? Is it a myth? Is it a fact? Is there an explanation for why you know it's like that? Okay. Um, because you mentioned that... Uh... Longer sleep is always, because you, you place it, the word always, qualifier always. So that's a myth. It's not always healthier. Um, if you, for example, uh, lose sleep for a couple of nights and uh, the following night you sleep a little bit longer, that's okay if you, you're going to say that you're going to make up for that. Although that's not really, um, it's like you, you're going to sleep in, right? Although it's not really... Um, maybe it's a start, but it's not really a, uh, a heavy solution. Uh, you would want to sleep earlier, okay? And maybe gradually make up for that. Uh, if, if you, if, because we have a term in sleep medicine, it's called sleep debt. It's like, parang utang, It's like you're paying up off a debt. So in a way, you just uh, try to uh, get more energy to so sleep earlier. But sleeping longer, Always, no, that's that. Uh, the, the concern about that is if we sleep longer all the time, it might be a sign that we are actually, ironically, if you think about it, sleep deprived when we talk about death. Okay, why am I saying that? Because there is a sleep disorder, it's quite common. We, we, um, we talk about obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea, symptoms of that is you're always sleepy. You're always sleeping. Um, even if you get nine, 10 hours of sleep, the next day, you still feel sleepy. Why? Because of the, because of the principle or the pathophysiology of sleep apnea, where you lack, uh, when, you, when you stop breathing, that's what apnea is. And it happens several times or so many times in the night. The problem there is you don't, there's a good chance that you don't get to the deep level of sleep. And when that happens, your mind uh, is trying to compensate by sleeping longer. The problem is that you don't get to the deep level of sleep and that's why you still feel sleepy. So unfortunately, if you have that, um, uh, of course, it has other complications. There are cardiovascular complications as well, but zeroing in on your question regarding uh, sleeping longer is always, that's actually a myth. It's actually, it's, it's, always, it's always healthy. 
that's actually a myth. You have to, you have to qualify that. And um, a lot of things have to be considered before you can say that uh, uh, sleeping a little bit longer uh, may be healthy, but not always. Oh, okay. So thanks for that, Doc. So, you know, that explains why sometimes when I oversleep, I wake up feeling really bad and I don't even have the same amount of energy I did like the day before. So I always tend to, sometimes, especially in weather is like this, I tend to oversleep, but I end up feeling very sluggish. Yeah, so it's very informative, actually, how you explained, like, that sleep death thing and the sleep apnea. Because, like, I think people usually think that as long as you get the eight hours or the seven, six hours, you're good. But if you don't get to, like, the deep stages of sleep where your body really recovers, then that's where you don't get the energy you need for the next day. Because that's where you kind of recuperate, no? In that that's correct. Stage of sleep. You're so correct. So thank yeah. you, Doc, for that. So, you know, I think the secret... For all you listeners and viewers, I think the secret is just really finding a balance also between sleeping too much or too little. So when your body asks you to rest up a bit more because you were sleep de- deprived the next day, then go ahead. But if you also have like a set number of hours where you feel really comfortable, then try not to oversleep like me. So although I've said earlier that I normally like to stay up, especially with the weather lately, I wouldn't be surprised if some of our viewers have also been sleeping longer than they normally would because the weather is definitely a factor. So since we're on the topic of sleeping hours, I'm curious about this next one. So does it really matter like the time of your sleep? So some people say you have to sleep by 10 because 10 to like 4 or 2 a.m. is when your body regenerates the most. That, you know, that's something that's been circulating for a long time but is that a myth or a fact so it doesn't matter what time you sleep as long as you get enough hours of sleep okay um as human beings we're designed to to be awake in the daytime and asleep at night now if we, we, we talk about the strict time then we talk about a what we call a rhythm or circadian rhythm or what we call our internal clock and when we talk about hormones to help us sleep, that's where melatonin comes in. And usually melatonin is secreted at around nine in the evening. Okay, so nine in the evening to probably about six or five in the morning. But after 12, the level of melatonin cat is not as high anymore compared to between nine to 12. So 10, if you put it at 10, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be too strict about it. Um, if you can, even around nine, then that's even better. But I, I, I wouldn't be too strict about it because what with all of our responsibilities, all of our work, working from home, staying in front of the computer, you'd think that since a lot of us are working at home or from home, you have less to do. Sometimes you got to do more to, to compensate, right? And that's the thing. So it's still very healthy to have a fixed schedule or, or still have that routine as if you're working um, not from home. If we're talking about sleep, 10 to 4. Okay, so that's, I would, uh, uh, when we talk about repair, there are, a, the, during the whole night, I wouldn't really try to zero in on when at this time of the night, this is repaired. In general, when we go to sleep, all our body organs are repaired, are energized, why for the next day why we've used um our energy during that today and tonight when uh we go to a slumber go to sleep we energize ourselves our whole body repair that needs to be repaired in time um for the next day okay so then you said 10 to 4 that's about six hours that's not bad will i stick with telling you that it has to be 10 to 4 no that's a myth you can it can be 11 to 5 or 11 to 6, all right? But I would recommend not after 12. Why? Our growth hormone, uh, very important for all of us. A lot of it is actually secreted after 12. And if you sleep at around 1 or 2 in the morning, you might miss that secretion. It's part of our circadian clock, okay? And when we talk about uh, our circadian clock, those are the two uh, reasons why we're, we're, uh, we, we we're sleepy or uh, we're alert. It's called um, uh, sleep homeostasis and circadian clock. So those are the two um, reasons why we feel 
uh, sleepy or we feel we're not sleepy, okay? But talking about, going back to your question about 10 to 4, it doesn't have to be strictly 10 to 4. It can be a little bit earlier. But the problem, if you sleep at 9 and you wake up at, for example, 5, uh, sorry, 3 o'clock, that's 6 hours, but you still want to sleep. Because, uh, you know, um, that's where that's where uh, those two concerns come in, the homeos, uh, homeos, sleep homeostasis and circadian um, rhythm. Uh, so homeostasis is the propensity to, to uh, go to sleep. Uh, circadian, that's our internal clock. Okay, so having said that, uh, like I said, it can it can be ten to four. That's okay. Uh, it's not a must. Eleven to uh, five or eleven to six, uh, but just as long as you get the right number of hours and not after twelve, because um, uh, there are, as I mentioned, uh, the hormones that are released. Remember, I said melatonin, uh, nine to twelve highest. Twelve, yes, still, but not as high. Then growth hormone about twelve or a little bit thereafter. If you miss that window, it, it might not be as you might not get the full benefits of your sleep. Not only that, if your melatonin level is not that high as well, it might also um, give you a little bit uh, possibly problems to to helping you maintain sleep. So, parang sayang kasi parang yung hormones salita na dapat sa hours na yun. Yes, yeah, so totoo yeah. yun. Kaya yung sinasabi na, you sleep early, that's not that's not false. That's true. Sleep early as much as you can and not too late because th- these things have been discovered uh, in, the, in the science of sleep medicine to, to hold uh, a lot of data and a lot of research, of course, for our, uh, for our well-being. So you heard it, guys. The timing of your sleep matters. So lala na sa mga college students who are here viewing or listening to us. I've been there. I know that we always stay up past 12. I know we like to pull all-nighters, even people working from home. But you heard it. It's, it really matters. So I guess it would be better to just sleep earlier and then maybe wake up a bit earlier na nga rin, mga 6, ganun, to maybe just catch up on your work, finish. Yeah, so yeah. I think that sounds yeah. healthier, no? Yeah. <laughs> Sayang yeah. or yung Or even 5. Or even, yeah. well, or even 5, yeah. So it's better talaga. So thank you for that. So this is a sign to fix your body clock, guys, and start following a proper sleeping schedule from now on. Your body will thank you for it. So the key is to regulate our circadian rhythm or our sleep-wake cycle. And then this next question is something I have personally heard so many times in the past. So napping makes up for lack of sleep at night. Is this a myth or a fact? That's a myth. Because napping, okay, uh, when, when, if we have good, we've been talking about um, quality of sleep and quantity of sleep. If you have those in, in good depth and number, technically you shouldn't, you don't, you wouldn't need to nap the next day. But, okay, you have a heavy lunch, um, it's a break, and you want to doze off for a few minutes, that's okay. Uh, call it a power nap. And that's okay. But when you talk about nap, that's just about 20 minutes. Okay. If you move further than that, that's not a nap anymore. And you would be getting more sleep that you should otherwise get in the evening. And that's not healthy. Okay. So you can nap just as long. You have to define what a nap really is. I think uh, it's up to 30 minutes probably, but I wouldn't go that Far, especially, I'll, I'll tell you why. When you when you take a nap, and it, it's more than a nap, it's longer than that, and you wake up in a deeper stage of sleep, which you can, you may wake up with a headache. Yeah, that happens so to me. It, it, that's not healthy. Okay, so it, it 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 did happen to you. Yeah, yeah so, it happens to me a lot. <laughs> so it's okay to take a nap. But make sure it, because it it can confuse your internal your your internal your internal clock. So remember. Uh, our circadian clock during the daytime, we have to be awake. Things do happen. It's a particular time of the day where our alertness is high or highest. I think it's about 10, 30, or 11. And then with regard to your concentration at a particular time of the day, uh, uh, blood pressure goes higher at a particular time of the day. Um, and later bit uh, in, in the morning, it's, it's why we go to we, we move our bowels at around 8, 8.30 because that, that's really part of our, our clock. 
Um, so and and I mentioned also melatonin. So these are things that really happen in our system, our internal clock. It can be confused if you take more than a nap in the afternoon. I, I guess that's why when I end up taking a nap and I tend to oversleep, it's like I kind of hard, have like a harder time sleeping at night. Yes, yes, that is a good illustration. Thank you for that, Kat. So that's that's important for me to hear also because I keep snoozing my alarm, even if I have heard a lot of times before that 20 minutes daw yung pinaka optimal for a nap. Sometimes it's just so hard to like get up kasi agad. So I think a lot of our viewers also experience that, especially pag nasa gitna na ng cramming sessions, gitna na ng mga projects, a lot of us tend to like take naps talaga and oversleep. Tapos yun nga, like what you said, Doc, wake up with a headache. So I think it's really all about being disciplined lang din na if you, if you want to take a nap, pag nag na yung timer, just get up. Mag na mag-oversleep. Yeah. So as explained by Dr. Sarte, we should be smart about naps since they are no substitute for good quality sleep. So I personally find it hard to sleep at night now whenever I take long naps and it messes up my sleep cycle the next day. So I think one thing we can all agree on is that the importance of getting enough sleep talaga, it's, you know, naps talaga, they're good for power naps, but if you oversleep, they're more detrimental, you know, to your health overall. So I've always been curious about this other one. So being short on sleep causes weight gain. Is it a myth or a fact? Okay. Um, the, the beauty of sleep is that uh, it does not only uh, restore our, um, our, our health. We have to go to the detail. Heart health is important. Brain health is important. Immune system is important. Um, and metabol metabolism is also important, which means that if we get good quality and quantity of sleep, our metab metabolism is better. And when you talk about that, we also talk about hunger hormones. You have leptin and ghrelin. Anyway, uh, it, it, it's, it, these hormones uh, have, a, have a purpose. They tell us if we're too full, they tell us if we need to eat more. The problem is that if we do not get quality and quantity of sleep, we resist these hormones. And not only do our, is our metabolism slower, we tend to get our energy more from the food we eat. So we, get, we, want, we would want to get more energy from the food. So it's, it's, we eat on one end, your metabolism is slower, maybe slower. On the other end, you would want to eat more because you're sluggish. And maybe if I eat more, especially if you like sugar, you know that sugar can be very addicting uh, to sweet. So the answer, okay, if you get good quality of sleep, definitely your metabolism is better. And that's where you can have a more, uh, a more pronounced control of your weight. If not, yes, you can gain more weight. So I never understood actually why, like how that was kind of connected. But, you know, with the, all, like the hunger hormones and everything, I think it makes a lot of sense because, yeah, I do agree that you get a lot of your energy from sleep. So if you don't have enough sleep, then you do get it from food. So that's actually a very good like illustration. And I think it keeps it simple for me and like all our other viewers to understand. So thank you for that like explanation and analogy. So for all of you looking to lose weight, being short on sleep does cause weight gain based on doctors, uh, Dr. Sada's explanation. So aside from eating right and making time for your daily workouts, be sure to set aside enough time to sleep and rest. So moving on to our next question, of course, we can't talk about sleep without talking about snoring. So we all know someone who snores in their sleep, which I'm very interested to know like the answer to this. So is snoring harmful or not? Is this a myth or fact? I mean, snoring is not harmful, but is this a myth or is it a fact? The sound. The sound itself, um, it's not. It's just a sound. Okay. Uh, just like any sound at night. Um, but if you want to qualify it, if your, your, your bed partner can't sleep because of the sound, that's when it can become harmful. Because your bed partner won't be able to sleep, 
or will probably unless he doesn't he or she doesn't mind um, anything that's loud, which is of course very difficult to to get quality sleep. So it's it's a sound, okay? The sound that is produced as a result of a turbulent air passage in the in the upper airway, and when it is produced, it can of course be a social factor. It, you know, the room can be, it, it's not silent. And the two things that keep us, uh, help us sleep are um, dark light, of course. I mean, no light at night, a dark room, I'm sorry, dark room and a quiet room. If it's very bright, it's hard to sleep. If it's very, if you have sound, it's noisy, you can't sleep. So on its own, snoring itself can be harmful, of course, to the other person. Um, individually, if your snoring is too loud or it gets getting loud, especially at night, it only means that the airway is closing or collapsing more. And that's where it can be harmful because it can lead to the condition that where it, your, your airway will completely collapse. And that's what we call sleep apnea. And when that collapses, you can't breathe. And when you can't breathe, oxygen level goes down. So you can't, of course, when oxygen level goes down, that's the, that's the problem. Your brain, your heart, your lungs, everything is affected. So snoring on, it's, that's the thing. So snoring alone uh, may not be harmful, but you have to qualify that because um, if it's a, it's a very, uh, if it, the snoring is not very loud, and it, it's, um, of course, uh, you're, you're alone in your room. Nobody's getting bothered. Um, and I said not very loud. And most of the time it's gone. And it, then definitely I would like to think that it's harmless. But if it gets louder and louder and louder, and not only your bed partner is affected, but you also can be affected. Um, uh, Snoring is a hallmark of a condition, a sleep disorder known as obstructive sleep apnea. And obstructive sleep apnea, so many comorbidities related to that can cause hypertension, can also cause uh, heart conditions, can also cause uh, um, cerebrovascular problems, uh, 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 metabolic problems like diabetes, can cause sleepiness the next day, problems with memory, okay, it can affect our memory, can also you, you can also have some psychological concerns like depression can also affect our reproductive or sexual um, life. So there are so many uh, complications uh, of obstructive sleep apnea. And the clue is not uh, difficult to look at. You just mentioned it, Kat, snoring. The louder the snore, the more regular the snore. The term we have for that is habitual, habitual snoring. It means that you the person is snoring more than four to five times per night in a week, and it's louder. It can be heard outside their bedroom, even if the door is closed. So that's already a clue. Okay. And from there, you ask questions. If the person may have obstructive sleep apnea, that is when the snoring can be harmful. Oh, okay. So thank you for that, Doc. Because I think even people our age in our early 20s, I think some of us already do like snore. Um, so I think it is important to kind of note that if it does get stronger and more frequent, then it might be like a symptom or it might be, it might show that you might have underlying health problems or it might cause other health problems now. So I think another question that a lot of our viewers are interested to know is, what causes sleep apnea and how come it's becoming more common? Like nowadays, it's as if the cases have gone up by a lot because there's also an increased awareness of what sleep apnea is. But I think in a nutshell, I think our viewers want to know like what exactly causes it and why is it becoming more common? It's multifactorial. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about sleep apnea, you zero in on the, on the area which causes that, and that's the upper airway. So you talk about the soft tissues in our, our airway, upper airway, you talk about a blockage in the throat. Uh, you have your, your, your tonsils, you have your, uh, your tongue, um, your soft palate, things that can, are narrow can, can close the airway. Uh, if, you have, if you're suffering from allergic rhinitis, if your nose is blocked almost 
all snorers sleep with their mouth open because they can't breathe through the nose or a big percentage of that. So if, you're, if you have allergic rhinitis, one of the symptoms, aside from sneezing, is nasal congestion. Mm -hmm. And if somebody um, can't breathe through the nose, you automatically breathe through the mouth at night. And when that happens, snoring is, may not be far behind. So one is anatomical, okay? Second is also related to problems. Uh, you know, this is something that can be acquired, okay? So maybe in relation to anatomical, if you, you, your parents or one of them snores, and of course, genetically, so that's where the genes can come in as well, okay? Um, of course, because you're, you have the same um, genetic inheritance. Weight plays a role, okay? Our weight, the heavy, heavier we are, okay? The, the, the shorter the neck, thicker the neck, that may predispose one to, to snore louder and course have more possibility of apnea is higher okay there's also a metabolic problem hypothyroidism okay the thyroid levels are low that can also cause snoring and even obstructive sleep apnea okay uh, of course there are other syndromes okay um, that can cause uh, obstructive sleep apnea but the ones that the first ones that I mentioned, are the more common ones, mm -hmm. okay? But there, when we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, the blockage can be in the nose, can be in the throat, can even be in the voice box or the larynx, the tongue, okay? So these are the more, uh, the, 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 the throat is really the more common area. And uh, if that area is checked and examined, then definitely it might give information um, as to why a person is, is uh, snoring and possibly having sleep apnea. So I actually never knew that it could be passed down from parents to children. I thought it was something that you kind of just developed over time or yun nga, parang as you get older, akala ko, like, it could just happen. So it's actually also very interesting to know that na it could be something that's genetic. And I think out of a lot of the things that you said, one of the things now we can control is our weight to make sure that we don't go too overweight, especially since obesity and being too overweight is one of the major risk factors also of having sleep apnea. So to our viewers, if you don't know yet if, that, if it's passed down to you, then the only, one of the main things you can do also is to make sure that you practice regular physical activity and maintain a healthy lifestyle so as not to go overweight or not to increase your risk of snoring and maybe possibly developing sleep apnea. So the next one is the most common sleep disorder, which is insomnia, which is the inability to fall or remain asleep. So I believe a lot of people have experienced this at some point in their lives, and recent cases may be anxiety-induced. So people have actually coined the term covid somia to describe that increased sleep disturbances associated with the pandemic. So our viewers would like to know what causes insomnia, and can sleep hygiene cure it? Okay, very good question. Um, COVID or coronasomia was, I think, mentioned this year uh -huh. in January by the BBC. I think they, an article came out, I think. And uh, with regard to that, uh, I'll just add, you mentioned difficulty sleeping, inability to sleep. The other is the inability to maintain sleep. Okay. So first, you can't sleep. You're tossing and turning in bed for mm -hmm. hours, so you can't sleep. The second is you get to sleep, but then you wake up and then you can't sleep anymore. So it's still early and then you can't sleep anymore after you wake up after a few hours. The third one is that um, you think you were able to sleep, but when, if you do wake, when you do wake up, it's like you feel that you're not refreshed. So those are actually the three definitions of insomnia. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward to this situation that we're all in about, um, and you mentioned COVID somnia. Uh, what are the causes of insomnia itself? And we are already in it. it, if not to mention already the stress that we're all in, okay, the worry that we're all in. And in particular with regard to, let's zero in on this time of uh, the coronavirus. We're all anxious. We're, if we're, are we gonna get sick with COVID? Uh, why somebody got sick? Or even if we know somebody that even died, that's where we start to worry, that in itself is already one cause. Remember I talked about the mind a while ago that helps us um, get good, qu 
quality in sleep, we have to be um, very um, stable with regard to that, no stress. So right now, if uh, during this time, and uh, we're worrying about our not only our present, but also our future, that can already be one cause. Secondly, the loss of routine. Okay, so uh, students, workers, they don't go to, uh, students go to, don't go to school, they're hooked on a computer or a tablet. Um, so they're just at home. The workers, uh, some are laid off, uh, sadly, or some just work from home. Again, you, lo you lose your routine. Yeah. The routine is important for our lives. Why? Because we are designed to be active during the day. We have their sign to be active during the day so that we can be resting at night. Okay, so that's that's the second one. Okay, third, and it's not unusual. COVID lockdown, we're still at it actually. We don't get to move to exercise. Okay, we it's it's very difficult that before what you would go to the gym, you would take a walk, you would do things out, you would travel, okay? These are things that are really um, missing right now, okay? So um, they're just, just to name a few, okay? These are happening now. So you're talking about um, uh, things that came out because of this uh, pandemic. And uh, the solution also lies how we can uh, adjust or adapt to that. But talking about, the causes, then uh, those are already glaringly, uh, a lot of the causes where we're worrying, our routine has changed, we are not able to go out. Um, those are already enough uh, reasons to, to make our uh, thinking unhealthy or uh, we're stressed and they can already affect our quality of sleep and cause, as you mentioned, insomnia. So actually, Doc, I used to think that insomnia was something because I heard somewhere that insomnia was passed down, but I, I don't know if it's if it's true. But what I read or what I saw or heard before was that if your mom had it, you might probably have it. So is, is that also true or is it just really like acquired from external factors like those that you've mentioned? It may be hereditary as well, mm -hmm. because... Um, uh, psychi uh, psychological or psychiatric conditions can also be passed down. And as I mentioned a while ago, um, when we talk about insomnia, about 35 to 45% mm -hmm. uh, of the causes of insomnia is psychological. Mm -hmm. And about 50 to 55% is medical or the physical. So if um, uh, by, by, uh, by your, your genes or genetically you have uh, psychological concerns in the family, of course, that can be passed on. Yeah. And when you have that, uh, as I mentioned, it can also be one of the causes of your, why? Like, for example, depression, anxiety. These are concerns that can uh, cause insomnia as well. So yes, it is. Mm -hmm. it can be hereditary. So thank you for that explanation, Doc. So I think a lot of people have started to take melatonin and other sleep medications. So is it good to be taking melatonin supplements if somebody has insomnia or if they have other sleep issues? Will it really help fix those issues? Uh, melatonin is not really for insomnia. Okay? It is not FDA approved for insomnia. Um, but uh, a lot of people are using it actually and, and, uh, melatonin is really for a sleep disorder, sleep disorder known as a circadian rhythm sleep disorder. And um, highlighting that, uh, what would come to mind is jet lag. Mm -hmm. So if you're traveling to a different time zone and to, to, to adjust right away, then melatonin, that's where melatonin is indicated. Mm -hmm. It's not indicated for, uh, in, for insomnia. But... Uh, for those who take it, because it's not, uh, uh, melatonin is a supplement. It's also mm -hmm. an antioxidant. And if uh, patients take it, uh, if patients take it and they're, okay, they're happy with it, it helps them, then that's okay. It's probably not that harmful. But as I mentioned, it's not 
um, indicated uh, the FDA the, the FDA indication is for circadian rhythm sleep disorders, not for insomnia. Uh, I would caution though, with regard to uh, those who are taking melatonin, they're 65 years and older, because it may cause sedation even the next day. And of course, especially for older individuals that might, you know, that, uh, that's not good if it can cause sedation. They have to be very careful if they're taking uh, uh, melatonin. Yeah. I actually tried taking melatonin a few months ago and for some, it did help me fall asleep faster, but for some reason, I would always wake up a bit groggier than normal. So maybe, maybe it's because it isn't really meant to really help you sleep if you don't have any legit problems. They would, uh, the data is about, you can probably have 0.5 to 3 milligrams thereabouts, although it's not really um, a rule. Uh, but as you mentioned, you can have those effects yeah. as, you, as, you, as you mentioned. So that's why it's not indicated really for insomnia. It's more for circadian rhythm sleep disorders. So thank you for that clarification, because I think a lot of our viewers have resulted to taking melatonin and those other sleep medications just to help ease with the anxiety throughout the day and to help them sleep better. But you guys heard it. You know, although it can help improve sleep, we should be careful in taking this supplement since it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So now that we know more about this, let's delve into what we should do moving forward. So, Doc, in your opinion, what are the most common signs that one needs to see a sleep specialist like yourself? Very important is with regard to your quality of life, especially your activity the next day. So let's start when you wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. We have our natural alarm clock. Okay, it's in about the middle, it's, it's probably about in the middle part of our brain. Um, and if you already have quality sleep, it's not unusual that if you have quality sleep, you make a good routine, you sleep the right, uh, the regular time at night, this will set you up to wake up the next day, refreshed. You don't need an alarm clock. Sometimes if you experience mm -hmm. that you wake up sooner than your alarm clock, it means that you're doing something good, mm -hmm. okay? Because your, your sleep-wake cycle is healthy. So having said that, if the next day you, you really need your alarm clock. You, you, you press the snooze button several times. Um, it might mean that you're suffering from sleep deprivation. Okay, you're lacking quad, quality or quantity of sleep or both. That's one. Okay, you get up, you prepare for work, you go to work, you're still sleepy. You go to work, you're 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 uh, you're tired. Your, your concentration is not good. Um, uh, and then if for some reason you take your blood pressure and it is elevated, of course, there are a lot of other causes of an elevated blood pressure, but these are just, just, um, these are just uh, possible clues. Uh, and then if, if you notice that this happens very often already, almost every day, and then uh, of course, uh, you, if you're driving, you're feeling sleepy behind the wheel, um, there's something wrong there. Uh, so these are just examples. Or if at night, as you mentioned, you're taught, you're, you, 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 you know that you're having a long day and you wanna get to sleep, but you find yourself still not asleep after an hour, and this happens several nights, or you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep, again, it happens. Then these are things, if, if these things happen very often, they're actually clues, okay? It's affecting your quality of life. It's, it's affecting your health. And it's probably about time for you to see a sleep specialist. I think I can kind of relate in terms of the, maybe the sleep deprivation part because I do keep snoozing my alarm clock and then my body clock is kind of messed up recently. I think a lot of us really have messed up body clocks. So thank you for at least enlightening us on the basic symptoms that we have to look out for. So for our last question, before our live questions from our viewers. So can you share with us um, your best tips for getting a better night's sleep? Just like the, the top ones that you can think of. Oh, yeah. Um, it's still important to, be, to, 
to live a healthy and active lifestyle. So when we talk about healthy, um, as much as possible, eat right. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we have your balanced diet. That's very important. Okay. Exercise during the day is very important. Even during the afternoon is very important. Um, so that's the, the first is a balanced diet, uh, uh, exercise. Third is to, um, of course, uh, make your, uh, develop a routine, develop a routine. So that includes waking up same time in the morning, having your, your meals, doing your work in the daytime as much as possible, same time, going to bed the same time at night. Okay. Um, that's very important. Make a, root, uh, uh, make a routine. And last but not least, I would tell uh, on top of my mind, meditation is important. Mm -hmm. Meditate is important. Yeah. Yeah. Because of course, to have a calm mind, you yeah. know, you, what we call you practice um, mind, uh, we, we, of course, uh, mindfulness meditation is actually the tool for mindfulness. And of course that, that can help also. So those are just on, on the top of my mind. There's several, several others. There are, there are behavioral therapies that can be taught, uh, or counseled. This is, uh, um, usually taught. And, uh, but the first four that I mentioned are, are the ones that are on top of my mind. So thank you for that, Doc. So you guys heard it also. You have to eat right. You have to develop a schedule. You have to exercise and practice mindfulness. So I think if all of these combined will definitely help you sleep better and will help you wake up feeling so much more refreshed. So thank you for that, Doc. I think those are things that are very doable. Naman. As long as you put your mind to it, kaya naman talaga siya gawin. So thank you for that. So I hope this serves as a wake-up call also for all of you to drop any habits that interfere with good sleep. So now for our live questions. So right now we have three, Doc. And the first one is, what triggers sleep paralysis and how can sleep paralysis be avoided? Sleep paralysis is actually um, produced as a result of a poor sleep-wake phase cycle. Maybe uh, just to illustrate for our viewers and our listeners, if any one of you have experienced, maybe when you're about to wake up, you open your eyes and then you can't move. Mm -mm. Okay. For several seconds, some would be afraid and panic. I know I would because that's what I, I've experienced yeah. that myself. So that's actually what we call sleep paralysis. If you experience that, you have to look at your sleep schedule. Mm -hmm. I mentioned a while ago, uh, develop a routine, a schedule. Don't miss quality sleep and quantity of sleep as much as possible. That's why I told you to, uh, I mentioned a while ago about the sleep diary. That's actually mm -hmm. important. Um, however, if it is accompanied by excessive sleepiness, um, uh, hallucinations, okay, it might be actually also a symptom of narcolepsy. Okay, uh, narcolepsy, sleepy, you're sleepy everywhere, even when you're eating, even when you're like right now, even if I'm, I'm talking. Mm -hmm. So narcolepsy is, is that hallucination, sleepiness, sleep paralysis, and what we call uh, cataplexy or sleep fits, as they call it. So you'll have to see a sleep specialist for that. Okay. So is there, what are like the main things you can do to avoid having sleep paralysis? It includes uh, having a uh, healthy sleep schedule and daytime schedule. So, which means that don't go to bed at, at too late. Yeah. Don't, you know, I mean, of course, with, with the rigors of, uh, okay, uh, in our society now, you, we talk about even those who work in the graveyard shift. Mm -hmm or mid shift, or those who just really have to work longer hours, um, it, it, you, you'll have to find a way to, to fix your schedule so you don't have to sleep too late. Um, because um, maybe if it, you need to do that because of your work, uh, then maybe it's okay to one or two nights, but you have to bounce back. 
Because if that ha- if you lose quality and quantity of sleep more often, then these things can come. Sleep paralysis can happen. It can be avoided. Mm-hmm. But definitely, you, you, you have to actively adjust your, your schedule. Yeah. So thanks for that, Doc. I think it mm-hmm. is quite scary to experience sleep paralysis. I've experienced it a few times. Only a few, mm-hmm. thankfully, but I can't really imagine if somebody experiences it all the time. It must be really hard. So our second question is, do night modes and blue light filters help maintain our circadian rhythm or are, or are they just gimmicks that don't have any proven claims? That's a good question. Um, the, the basic notion is that as much as possible, you don't expose yourself to light mm-hmm. uh, at night because it can confuse, uh, well, okay, exercise at night and uh, bright light at night can confuse the release of your melatonin, remember? And uh, that's actually why I know a lot of people are trying melatonin. Like I said a while ago, if it, it, it's okay and, you know, it sets you up to sleep and it's probably, you know, okay. But um, that's, that's it. So the, the blue light filter, okay, that is the blue light that is emitted by our gadgets. Um, if you have a filter, of course, anything that can dim Mm-hmm. The, 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 the light coming from your gadgets. In the first place, you shouldn't be using the gadgets late at night anymore, okay? Yeah. Because remember, the, the principle of melatonin, melatonin release is important mm-hmm. um, during the circadian time or at, at night. So, of course, yes, it is, uh, if, if, if uh, you really have to, it's for what it's worth, yes, use a filter. Uh, the best is, of course, to minimize use, especially close to bedtime. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that it doesn't confuse your uh, your internal clock. Yeah, I think a lot of us are guilty of that, Doc. I'm again guilty of that. I think I don't really have the best sleep habits, so I, I learned a lot from our talk also tonight. And so our last question is: so the bangungot phenomenon is something that commonly happens here and it's commonly it's commonly said the bungungot term here in the philippine culture but there isn't much knowledge about it in like western culture or there's just no specific explanation for what bungungot really is so in your own words doc could you explain what bungungot is and what are its causes and is it merely like a cover for an underlying condition Bangungot is actually not um, unique to the Philippines. In other countries, they have other names for it. Uh-huh. But in the, the scientific term is actually SUNDS, Sudden Unexplained Nocturnal Death Syndrome, which means that a person who suffers from bangungot goes to sleep at night and doesn't wake up the next day. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, the data about bangungot is based on what was observed in that patient the previous night. And they're talking about heart problems. They're talking about apnea uh, as contributing factors. Okay, so some have been known to snore loudly before it happened. Uh, and then some say that they have a heart problem when they reviewed. It's called the Brugada syndrome. So in other words, when you talk about bangungot, it happens. There are signs when the person is moaning at night or snoring. Yeah. So when you talk about that, that's when you might probably think it might be related to apnea. Remember, I, I said mm-hmm. sleep apnea. So, in other, that's where I, I I I'd like to recommend that if somebody is sound asleep, then it means he's silent. He or she's silent. It means that air is flowing well, oxygen is getting to the vital structures of the uh, uh, of our body, mind and mind and body, and you're getting not only a good duration of sleep but good depth of sleep. That's what we call sound asleep. If a person is snoring, tossing and turning in bed, um, you know, looking for a good position, and you would say that it is related to sleep apnea, unfortunately, these are things that have been seen in, in individuals who had bangungot. So I would, I would caution anybody, if you know somebody and you're concerned that the, when we say apnea, the person stops breathing. Mm-hmm. Okay, after loud snore, he stops breathing and then, then snores again. If you see that uh, in a person, a friend, um, a spouse, or a relative, 
you might want to suggest, why don't you have that check just to be sure? Because uh, that's why it's still S-U-N-D-S, sudden and unexplained nocturnal breath, because there are theories about that. Uh, but a lot of them are still unexplained. Oh, okay. So there, there are some symptoms naman or signs na you could maybe pay more attention to just to ensure na hindi mangyari yun. Okay, because scary then yun, Doc. Parang if hindi na lang bigla nagising, it's very scary. So thank you for, you know, these things to watch out for. And we just have one follow-up question. Um, mm-hmm. There's an additional one lang. And it's for older people who wake up three to five times a night to urinate. How do we have better and more consolidated sleep? Okay. Older people have a tendency to sleep earlier. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it, it's called advanced sleep phase. Now, in, in contrast to younger people who have delayed sleep phase, they sleep later. They yeah. sleep late, they wake up late. Older people sleep early, they wake up early. Okay. So uh, with regard to your question, and going to the toilet several times, yeah. um, then of course we can only uh, we can only um, we can only guess because uh, one of the symptoms of diabetes is going to the toilet several times in the night. Okay, one symptom of obstructive sleep apnea is also waking up and going to the toilet several times in the night. So I would inquire uh, that with regard to uh, a patient or an older patient. But as I mentioned. Uh, separate to what I mentioned, um, older people have a tendency to really sleep earlier. And sometimes, for example, they sleep at 9 or 7 or 6 or even 8 o'clock. They sleep for 5 hours. Then they wake up at 2 o'clock. That's already 6 hours. Or they wake up at 3 o'clock. That's already 7 hours. That should already be okay. And then they wake up and then they can't sleep anymore. So if you think about it, it might mean that you've already had your quality of, and quantity of sleep. Okay, so we have to qualify those things. Um, uh, remember, I talked about sleep homeostasis and circadian rhythm. Uh, homeostasis is our propensity. Okay, because if you, if, you, if you slept at night and you've woken up at six and you can't sleep anymore, you've had seven or eight hours, your sleep, your sleep propensity or homeostatic is low. Okay, you, you won't feel sleepy. That builds up during the day. In, in your circadian rhythm, you're supposed to wake up already. You're supposed to be alert already. So these are things that just have to be explained. Okay, so I, I, I think I've definitely noticed that also, Doc, um, especially with oh. younger people, like we also sleep late. But like my parents, my dad, ganyan, he sleeps very, very early nga. So yeah, it's something that I've also noticed. So thank you for answering that question again, Doc. And to our viewer, I hope that he was able to explain it well also. So to end, I would just like to thank Dr. Sarte for sharing his knowledge and expertise on sleep health with us tonight. So before we conclude, maybe you want to say a few final words for us, Doc? I would just like to thank I am patient for inviting me so that they can share um, what I can regarding um, Sleep disorders, there are more than 80 sleep disorders. We just touched some of it. But I, of course, uh, eat healthy, uh, exercise, um, meditate. And of course, especially during this pandemic, take care. And of course, God, God bless. Thank you for that, Doc. So I'm sure all of our viewers have learned a lot from the session tonight, as have I. So I also needed to hear this, Doc, to get my sleeping habits better. So we would just like to remind everyone that some of the things discussed earlier may not be applicable to all cases, so it's still best to consult your specialist. So if you'd like to consult with Dr. Sarte also, you can also send us a message and we'll connect you and we'll help you get in touch with Dr. Sarte. So once again, I'm Kat, your host for this month's Ask a Doctor episode, Pillow Talk. And have a good evening, everyone. So again, book your appointments through I Am Patient. No more waiting. Again, it's www.iampatient.ph. Thank you.